as I walk through life and experience more and more of life, I recognize that there's things in our language, things that we say that become part of just sort of kind of cultural norms and speech that after a while they kind of disappear. Things that people say and they seem totally normal, and then if they popped up with the same word a decade or two later, it wouldn't even make sense. And isn't that just groovy? Uh, how many of you remember saying groovy? How many of you remember saying it a whole lot? How many of you say it as a regular thing now? There's the point, right? There's some words that are just kind of part of culture and they, they disappear. Uh, how about this one? Some of you might not even know what this means. Oh, what a, what a cute little ankle biter. What a cute little ankle biter. You know what that is? It's a, I, I hear it's a dog, a puppy. It's, it's a little kid. It's a toddler. People used to call toddlers ankle biters. I don't know if that was the case back when I was an ankle biter or not, but, uh, um, and, and then there's other words that, that sort of have disappeared. I, there was a word that, when I was a kid, that was pretty common. I remember, and actually it came up in my mind one time, I actually said it, uh, I had uh, been saving cereal box tops, to give you a sense of my age. I remember, Jimmy, you remember you can save cereal box tops, throw a little bit of money in with them, mail them to the, to the maker of the cereal, and they send you a really cool toy. So I had this one toy that was in the back of the, the cereal box. I really wanted it. Got the box tops, got the money, sent it in. I got to open it up. It was not anything like what I was thinking it was going to be. And I said, what a total jip. I've been, anybody remember that one? Now, I did a little bit of background on the linguistic background. It's probably not a good thing to say because it's talking about a group of people, and I won't get into that now. But uh, it's, it was about gypsies. But anyways, we won't get into that. That's another, another thing. But, uh, but it's like that word's disappeared. People don't say that anymore. Now, there's, there's some words that disappear, it doesn't really matter, but there's some words when we lose them, it matters. And today we're going to talk about this word, holy, holiness. It's a word that used to be common, at least in the vocabulary of Christians, and we don't use that word a whole lot anymore. But it's a good word, it's a powerful word. It's a word that really matters. And as we talk about the arrival of Jesus we're thinking together about what it means. And, and, and here's the reality. Jesus didn't just arrive 2,000 years ago. He did arrive then. We, we call the first coming of Jesus, his arrival, we call it his incarnation. That he was incarnate, that, that God became man. Emmanuel dwelt among us, God with us. So when Jesus first came, there's, there's this incarnation. But when you put your faith in Jesus, if you're a Christian, or if you receive the grace of Jesus and become a Christian, there's another arrival. God arrives in you. He shows up, and he, he inspires you. He transforms you. He changes your life. I call that inspiration. When Jesus arrives in your life, and every day as he shows up by his spirit, he inspires, and he leads, and he guides you. So, so there's an arrival 2,000 years ago, the incarnation. There's an arrival into our personal lives, and we're inspired by the presence of the spirit. But there's also another arrival, and that is every time you, if you're a Christian, every time you walk into a room, every time you show up somewhere, Jesus arrives with you. Why? Because he lives in you. So Jesus is arriving. He's showing up all the time. Everywhere you go, everything you do, he is, he is God with us. He's God with you. And so today we're talking about when Jesus arrived, when he arrives, and when he will arrive with you, we're talking about when Jesus arrived, holiness entered our world. Holiness came. Now, what is holiness? Uh, there's a couple ways to define holiness. One definition of holiness is something that's different, that's set apart, that's distinct. And so Jesus, who is, who is absolutely holy, is different and distinct from all of us from our world. So part of holiness is this unique difference and set-apartness and distinctness. But also part of holiness is purity. Something that is holy has been cleansed, is pure. And so, and so when you think about that, when you think about holiness and Jesus showing up, I, I want to ponder that, what it meant when Jesus first came and when holiness came into the world, what it means when we understand that when Jesus moves into our lives, he not only makes us holy, but he calls us to walk in holiness. And then what does it look like when God's people, who filled with the presence of Jesus, are different than the world, walk into the world and bring the holy presence of Jesus with us? It's a topic we don't think about a lot, but it's very, very important. So let's start in the, the first arrival, when Jesus first came. Arrival incarnation. When Jesus came to our world, Pure and perfect holiness entered an unholy world. When Jesus came into human history, when he walked on this earth, the holiness of heaven entered the brokenness of our world. That perfect holiness came. Now in the Old Testament, there's, in, in, in the prophecy of Isaiah, 
Isaiah encounters God in all of his holiness. And he's transformed because of that encounter. And the same Jesus who came and walked among us was God with us, Emmanuel, God with us, and he came as the one who was holy, holy, holy. So let's look together. If you have your Bibles, look with me at Isaiah chapter 7. I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 1. In Isaiah chapter 6, he encounters, he has a vision of God. Now, we were studying Revelation recently as a congregation, and I told you that when you hear a passage like this that's a vision, it's better to see it and kind of hear it and experience it, not just to mentally ponder it, but to almost picture what's going on. So as I read this passage, try to picture in your mind what's unfolding, the, the, the vision that Isaiah saw. Isaiah 6.1. In the year that King Uzziah died, that gives us the setting, the timetable. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah writes these words of his vision. I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, these heavenly beings, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, The doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. I'm coming apart. I'm undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth, seared my mouth, and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, here am I. Send me. Wow. Do you see it? What a picture. Isaiah was never the same again because he came into the presence, had a vision of the holiness of God. And we have to understand that when Jesus was incarnate, when Jesus came among us, God, who is holy, 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 he's God with us. That same God came among us to this world. We have to understand that the God that we worship is one God, one in his being, but in person, he's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and each is holy, holy, holy. Each each is, is drawing near to us. When Jesus came to this world, God came among us. So just some simple truths that we should lock away in our hearts at Christmas time, but all year round. First, God is perfectly holy, and Jesus is God. God is perfectly holy in that he's, he's absolutely other. He, he, he is not uh, no, you know, what's normal for us. God is so different. He's so removed and so different. He's present, but he's also so distinct and different. But God is also holy because he's absolutely pure, absolutely perfect, no defilement, no sin, no wrong in God. And that was true when Jesus came and walked among us. Holiness came and was born in a manger and walked on this earth. He is holy, holy, holy. And Jesus brought a way to holiness through the cleansing of his sacrifice. Jesus not only came as the one who was holy, 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 but he said, I will show you a way that you can be holy also. When Jesus died on the cross, When he hung on the cross, the perfect, sinless, holy Lamb of God, he took our sin and our shame and our punishment that we deserved all on himself, and he offered to us his holiness. He offered what we could never attain on our own. The one who was holy, holy, holy said, I can through my death and sacrifice and resurrection and my victory, I can offer you my holiness. That's part of the Christmas story. Don't miss it. 
I love the manger. I love Christmas trees and presents and all those things are wonderful. But don't miss the one who is in the manger is the holy God of heaven who came to give his life for you so that you could be made holy and come into his presence. Amazing. And Jesus also brought the power to grow in holiness. Not only did Jesus come and as the Holy One who said, through my death and resurrection, I will offer you my holiness, but he said, I will also teach you how to walk in and live in holiness so that you can then, as you receive Jesus, recognize the holiness he gives you, but also hear his call to grow and to walk and to become more like Jesus, more unique in this world, more different than the world, not, not in a bragging above way, but in a humble way, coming alongside saying, I want to be more like Jesus. And can I tell you, the more you become like Jesus in this life, the less you look like the world. It just happens. Your mindset changes. Your words begin to change. Your heart begins to change. What your hands are up to and about in the course of the it changes. We stand apart as we become more and more like Jesus so that we can point to Jesus and help people see his presence and his glory. So when Jesus came in the incarnation, when in, the, in that first coming, when Jesus arrived, he came as the one who was holy, holy, holy. He came to reveal holiness to us to let us know that if we receive his grace, he will make us holy, and to call us to then walk in and grow in and live in that holiness. But now, today, when a person puts their faith in Jesus, he arrives again. The one who is holy, 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 the one who died on the cross and rose again and ascended to heaven, that Jesus, through the presence of his Holy Spirit, moves into us and leads our lives and guards, guides our lives. So that arrival is the inspiration. He inspires us. He transforms us. He energizes us because he lives in us. Jesus is here with us and in us. And hear these words. Jesus makes us holy, and he grows us in holiness. Jesus makes us holy. Pastor Dennis was talking about the, those two words, the, the, the word salvation and the word sanctification. Salvation, when we put our faith in Jesus, we are saved, he makes us holy. Do you know that when God looks at you, when you put your faith in Jesus, when you come to the cross and you accept his death, his resurrection, you accept Jesus' forgiveness, do you know that God then takes all your sins away from you? Not because you're so good, but because Jesus is so good. And he puts the holiness of Jesus on you. So when the Father in heaven looks at you, he sees you as holy. Do you, do you recognize that? Because he sees the holiness of Jesus which covers you. Get the point? It's not what you did, it's what he did, but you accepted that gift. That's salvation, that we become holy through the grace of Jesus. Sanctification is that we also continue to grow in holiness, becoming more and more like Jesus. If you have your Bibles, look with me at 1 Peter chapter 1. When we think about our lives and God's call on us, in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, we read these words. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober. I mean, you're paying attention. You're sharp. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Now listen to these words. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Don't live the way you used to live. Don't stay the same. But just as he who called you is holy, just as God who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Somebody say, whoa. Try it again. Somebody say, whoa. As he called you as holy, you be holy in what? In all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. That's the passage that Dennis quoted earlier out of the book of Leviticus. Peter's quoting Leviticus. That comes up, I think, three different times in Leviticus. Be holy because the Lord your God is holy. So what we recognize here is that on the one hand, through the death of Jesus on the cross, when we receive his sacrifice and receive his gift of grace in faith, we are made holy. And God looks at you and says, I see you through Jesus, you are perfectly holy. And then grow in holiness, becoming more and more like Jesus with each passing day. And then in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, we read these words. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates our body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God, perfecting, becoming more and more like Jesus. Now, what a call. 
What a challenge. What a life it is learning to walk with and follow Jesus, to be in his presence, to become like him, to seek his face. So here's some truths that we see as we understand that Jesus moves into us, that by his grace, we, when he arrives in our lives, he, we, are, we are being made holy through his grace and we are growing in holiness. A question for you. Uh, for, first, a, a, a statement. We are made holy through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. We are made holy. If you've come to the cross, if you've received Jesus, whether you were five years old like my wife Sherry was, whether you're, whether you're 15 or 16, a teenager like I was, we had people baptized today. That, that we had somebody talking to me this morning about being baptized or said they want to be baptized who became a Christian just, just recently and just started walking with Jesus. Wherever you are on that journey, do you understand that when the perfect God of heaven looks at you, when you stand before God one day when this life is over, if you've come to the cross and received Jesus, he looks at you and he says, what sin? There's no sin he sees. Does it mean that God doesn't know that you've sinned? No, that's not what it means, because Jesus died for your sins. He sent Jesus because of your sins. He knows. What he says is, I will treat you as if you have not sinned. Why? Because the righteousness and holiness of Jesus is yours, is on you. That should blow your mind. That should warm your heart. That should give you hope this Christmas. If you put your faith in Jesus, you are made holy before God. And if you haven't done that yet, you say, well, you don't understand. You don't know all my sins and all that I've done. God couldn't forgive me. Let me tell you, yes, he could. He's waiting with his arms open right now. And if you receive his grace, he will wash you clean. And he will look at you through the holiness of his only son who died on the cross and paid the price and said, it's finished, it's paid, it's done. He will see you through the work of Jesus as made holy. So here's a question for you. Do you live with a deep conviction that you are holy in God's sight? I'm not talking about theologically understanding. I'm talking about do you understand that the God who made you, the God who loves you, the God who is holy, 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 if you've come to the cross and received Jesus, you are his beloved child and you are cleansed and that's how he sees you. Do you understand that? I think most days we don't. Most days we listen to the voice that comes from other places, from, from the pit of hell, who says, oh, when God looks at you, he sees all you've done and all you think, and he's disgusted, he's upset, he's embarrassed by you. The enemy from the pit of hell speaks those lies. And you've got to hear God say, no, when I look at you, I look at you through the finished work of Jesus, and you are made holy. And would that change your perspective on how you see yourself? It should. So that's the, that's the first reality, that God, we're made holy. But here's the second thing that we grow in holiness through the power unleashed at the empty tomb. We understand that Jesus died on the cross, paid the price, conquered sin, conquered death, conquered hell, rose again in glory, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he rules and reigns. Do you recognize now that he says, I want to unleash my holiness in you. I want you to look different. I want you to grow in purity and, and to live a cleansed life. That Jesus wants us to walk with him and to grow in our faith. And so here's, here's the next question. Are you taking steps to grow in holiness each day of your life? Yeah, I'm made holy through Jesus, praise the Lord, but I'm still growing in holiness in this life. It seems like a little bit of a kind of a contradiction or a little bit of, wait a minute, am I, am I made holy and totally holy through Jesus or am I growing in holiness? And the answer is both. You're made holy because of the work of Jesus. That's done. It's finished. Jesus on the cross and it's finished. It's paid. That's done. But in this life, we're still taking steps to become more like Jesus. And remember, one of the definitions of holiness is being different. When we forgive, when people wrong us, that's different in our world because people aren't real forgiving these days. We stand apart. We look different. That's holiness. We're set apart. When we come to serve and help instead of take and demand, we look different. We're set apart. We're holy. And when we turn our eyes and our hearts from the things that are impure in this world and seek the things that are beautiful and good and righteous, that's part of our journey of holiness. And so we have to look and say, I, I, I want to not only know that I'm made holy, or if you become a Christian, you'll be made holy, but what does it look like to grow in holiness? And so just quietly in your own heart, I want to invite a moment for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. If you're a Christian, he lives in you. And so just ask these questions just between you and the Lord in your own heart. Or do you have a growing sense 
that you have holy lips, the things you say, the words that come out of your mouth, are you growing in holiness with your words? Do you bless people way more quickly than you blast them? Do you care with your words instead of cursing, pointing out what's wrong with everything? Are your words, is your mouth, are your lips quick to forgive because you've been forgiven by God in Christ? Or do your words speak judgment? Are your words, your lips becoming more and more holy? Because that will set you apart in the world. For today, until Christmas time through the new year, would you say, God, give me holy lips. Make my words more and more what you want them to be. Let my words stand apart and be set apart because they're filled with grace and kindness in this harsh world. Do you have holy hands? What you do, what you touch, the work of your hands, do you give it to the Lord? Do you serve with your hands much more quickly than demanding that other people would serve you? Do you build up or do you break? Are your hands more often clenched in a fist or open to bless, to give, to help, to serve? Would you just say, Lord, make my hands holy? It's a journey. I'm not perfected yet. I made, yes, Jesus, I'm made holy because of you, but, but Lord, I want my hands through my normal days to be set aside, to be different, to be consecrated for works that would honor you, Jesus. Take a moment quietly in your heart and just reflect. Do you have holy eyes? What you view, what you look at, what consumes your attention? Are your eyes turned more quickly to beauty or carnage. There's a reason that traffic slows down whenever there's an accident as people drive by. They want to crane their neck and look and see. Do your eyes turn toward that which is good and beautiful and true or towards the things that are dark and broken? Do you look at things that edify or that just entertain? Would you just quietly say, Lord, let me think about my eyes. Let my eyes seek holiness. Look at that which is beautiful. Be drawn to that which is good. And Lord, give me the wisdom to, to shut off, to turn off, to disconnect those things that just feed pictures and images and thoughts through my eyes to my mind that are, are just not good, that aren't beautiful, that aren't honoring, honoring to you. And think about your mind. Is your mind growing in holiness? What you ponder, what you think about, what, what, you just, what, what kind of runs up and down the hallways of your brain? What is it you're thinking about throughout the day? Are they the things that are different that set you apart, things that honor God that lead you to holiness? Is your mind consumed with peace or with anxiety? Man, we're in an anxious time. Would you say, Lord, Guide my mind to peace, even in this crazy season. Calm me down. Let my mind not be consumed by all the what-ifs of all the worst. But let my mind be fixated on that which is good and beautiful, on you, Lord Jesus. Does your mind focus on that which is eternal, what lasts forever, or the temporary trinkets of this world that last for an hour or a week or a month or maybe a lifetime, but they go up in dust, they're gone one day. Would you say, Lord, make my mind holy. Let my thoughts more and more become your thoughts. That I might become more and more like you. When Jesus arrived, when Jesus came to this world, the incarnation, the one who is holy, 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 left heaven and came and moved into our neighborhood, moved into our world, moved into our lives. We should be overwhelmed by that. When we put our faith in Jesus, if you already have, you know it's true. If you haven't yet, just understand, when you put your faith in Jesus, who died on the cross, who rose again, he arrives in your life, he moves in, and he never leaves. He just coming, come, keeps coming in waves and waves of his presence and of his beauty and his goodness. He arrives in your life. It inspires you. It transforms you. It leads and guides you. And you, and you recognize, I am made holy through the finished work of Jesus on the cross, thank you, Lord, that when you look at me, I'm cleansed. But also that as you fill me with your spirit in this life, 
I'm walking, I'm growing in holiness. I'm becoming more and more like Jesus. That leads us to our third arrival, and that is that when we who have met the, the Christ who came, when Christ comes into our lives, everywhere we go, everything we do, he goes with us. Jesus is arriving on military bases every day. He's arriving in doctor's offices every day. He's arriving on your school campus. When you show up, he shows up with you if you're a Christian. He's arriving in your neighborhood. He arrives in your home. Why? Because when you come, he's there with you. And so here's the third arrival. Arri this arrival, this illustration. God illustrates his holiness, his presence through our lives. When we walk into any room, Jesus comes with us. We enter with the Holy One and reflecting his holiness. Hebrews 12, 14 says this. Listen to these words. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, what does that mean? How do you read these words? Without holiness, <clears throat> no one will see the Lord. I think there's, there's probably at least two primary meanings there. Without us coming to the cross and receiving Jesus and being made holy, we won't see God one day. We can't make it to heaven on our own. We have to be cleansed of our sin and Jesus paid. Without the holiness of Jesus placed on us, we won't see the Lord. But I think there's another meaning here. And in the context of this passage, I think it's clear. Without us walking and living and growing in holiness, our non-believing friends are going to have a hard time seeing the Lord. And when you walk in holiness, when you're becoming a different kind of person, when you think differently and talk differently and act differently and love differently and serve differently, People see the Lord. Why? Because you're different. See, holiness, one definition of holiness is we're different. We're set apart. We look at it like this sometimes. Oh, set apart means, oh, that evil, wicked world, get him away from me. Get, get me out of here. I don't want that stuff. But when Jesus, the holy, holy, holy God of heaven, came to earth, did he run away from messed up people? No, he ran to them. God loves people who have issues. You following me? And that includes me, and that includes you. Right? Being set apart is not running away from the people in this world. Being set apart is being in the world, but not of the world. Being set apart is walking with people and loving them and caring for them. And as they look at you, they say, man, everyone's so unforgiving, and you keep forgiving people. You're different. That's holiness. You're set apart. I mean, everyone is so judgmental right now. Our culture is so judgmental, and yet you love people right where they're at, even when you don't agree with them. That's holiness. You are set apart. You're different. Everyone's eyes watch the same entertainment, the same stuff, the same thing, whatever, whatever the media creates, just gets put there, everybody just consumes it. And a Christian, you know, there's Christians who go, oh, no, that's not really my thing. You know, that, that's that, you know, the, the, the violence actually bothers me. The, pr the profanity and the, the, all this stuff, it's just, it's not, it's not my thing. What do you mean? You're, a, you're human. It's all of our thing. That's not, and and, and it, you, know, you know the only time the word holy gets used in our culture these days? Oh, he's kind of holier than thou. It's a negative thing, right? Oh, that's not what we're talking about. We're not, I'm better than you. It's just we, we live in a different way. Why? Because we're learning to walk in the holiness of Jesus. And when we stumble and mess up, and we all do, he picks us up, he dusts us off, puts us back on our feet and says, okay, honey, keep on going. Keep on growing. Because you are already made holy at the cross. That's been taken care of. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. When you're saved, you're cleansed, you're made holy. Now we're growing in holiness so that we can show the world, both through the fact that we're different at times, we don't come at the world the same way, and there's a sense of purity and cleanness that grows in us as we walk with the one who is holy and become more like Jesus. We don't stand above other people and look down on them and judge them. We just seek to live more and more like Jesus. So holiness shows the cleansing impact of Jesus. As we grow in holiness, we show that Jesus has washed us clean, and we have the sense of this cleansing, the goodness of it. We're thankful for it. Holiness shows the forgiving nature of Jesus. When we walk in holiness and know that I've been made holy, all my sins are washed away, as I walk to grow in holiness, I can forgive others. I can love others. I can serve others. Why? Because I was so good? No, because he was so good. Because I paid the price? No, because he paid the price. And as he's loved me, as he's forgiven me, as he's cared for me, as he's served me, so I will love and serve you. And the light of Jesus shines in a dark world through you. 
through you. But pastor, you don't understand. I try and I struggle and I fall. Join the club. You could say like the Apostle Paul says from the depth of his soul in Romans chapter 7. The Apostle Paul says, I don't, even, don't really understand how I work the things I want to do. I fail to do the things I don't want to do. I do those things. And he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin? That's the Apostle Paul. He's saying, man, I'm struggling. I want to live for Jesus. And sometimes I don't. And I, I want to stop that. And sometimes I do it. And he struggles. That's the journey of sanctification. But if you keep getting up and keep following Jesus and keep living like him, you will look different than the world. You will sound different than the world in a beautiful way. Not in a judgmental way. But showing what life could be. And people will look at you and they will wonder, can I ever forgive the way she forgives people? Can I ever love the way he loves people? And if they ask you, you say, oh yeah. I only do it through the power of Jesus who's in me. And his arms are open to you too. And by the way, I fall on my face probably more often than I get it right. But I keep getting back up and God keeps loving me and he keeps leading me. Isn't that, isn't that the journey of the Christian life? We're made holy, but we're growing in holiness. Holy shows the life-changing power of Jesus. It unleashes the power of Jesus to transform a life, to transform a home, to transform the world. And so here's, here's the big picture. Holiness entered our world on Christmas. When Jesus came, holiness came to our world. It enters our life when we place our faith in Jesus. And he inspires us to live like him. And we walk in holiness into a world that needs to see purity and hope in a dark time. Enjoy Christmas lights. They're beautiful. But be the light of Jesus. Take your next step into holiness. Lord, how do you want to change the way I think? What's some of the junk you want to get out of here? Lord, let's work on this by your spirit. Let's work in me. God, guide my words. Let me speak more like Jesus. Maybe my first step is just that occasionally just to, I was going to say, shut up. I probably, as a pastor, won't say, I'll say, close your little pie hole. How about that? Is that better? Uh, maybe my first step is just saying, I've got to close my mouth sometimes. And maybe your first victory isn't speaking words of grace. It's just mm, saying nothing. And you'll feel the Holy Spirit say, good job. That's my kid. <laughs> and maybe the next time you say nothing and you also think, how can I bless? And as we grow in holiness, all oh, growing in holiness is just becoming more like Jesus. Then we look different than the world. And, and taking the things that are impure and, and ungodly and just pushing them aside and battling against those things and pressing forward. And as the weeks and months and years go by, as you become more and more like Jesus, the world will see him. The darker our world gets, the brighter the light of Jesus shines. And if you're a Christian, Jesus said you are the light of the world. Jesus, this is our prayer this Christmas season. That people would enjoy flashing beautiful lights on homes and trees and decorations on, on lawns. But Lord, that there would be thousands of lights shining around this community, around the world. Because we have been reminded that you who are holy, 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 through your work on the cross, Jesus, have made us holy and you are growing us in holiness. May we become more like you. May we look more like you, think more like you, speak more like you. Know your grace when we struggle and keep pressing on that the world may know, the world may see that you want to be their light and their forgiver and their leader. This Christmas season, O oh Jesus, let us be reminded of your holiness and grow it in us. We pray in your name and for your glory. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple words of invitation. If you want prayer today, if you're outdoors in the courtyard, if you're in the family worship venue, or if you're here in the worship center, we'll have teams up front here that are waiting to pray for you. They love to pray. Whatever your need or joy, don't leave without being prayed for. If you're online... I encourage you to either, either call the number you see right there and someone's waiting to pick up the phone and pray with you or email us your prayer needs and we'll pray over the next couple of weeks. We'll put those on our prayer list. We have a great prayer team that will be praying faithfully for you. If you're new at Shoreline, we're so glad you're here. If you're on campus, we want to meet you face to face. So please don't leave until you go right by the, in the connection center, right in the lobby here. You'll see the connection center and they want to give you a little gift bag. Thank you for coming, answer your questions and just give you a warm personal welcome. If you're online, all you have to do is just text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen 
and we will then reach out to you and try to connect with you and get to know you a little bit personally. Christmas Eve services, I want to encourage everyone here, put it on your schedule, whether you're on campus or online, on Christmas Eve at 2.30 and 4 o'clock, we are going to just blow this place up with worship. It's going to be amazing. And so if you can be, if you can be on campus, if you've been at home for convenience sake, not a health concern, come join us. Christmas Eve, invite friends along with you. We have, gift, we have cards you can use to invite people with, and we'll also send you an e-card that you can then forward to people and put on your social media and just share. Join us at Shoreline, 2.30 uh, and 4 o'clock, and we will be online with those services live streaming, so we'll be here on campus and online. And please hear this. On Sunday the 26th, the entire worship experience is online. The only time that, that we're doing this because it's right after 25th. We're giving our staff a little bit of a break. People are gone. There's a lot going on. So if you show up here on campus on the 26th, you know, take some time, pull some weeds, clean up some trash, then go home and go to, go to church because we won't be here. Uh, do something productive all year, but we won't be here, all right? We will be, I'll be live, I'll be, you'll be watching the sermon from, my, from our living room. You'll be watching the music from Cole's living room. And you can be wherever you are, your living room or hotel, wherever you're traveling, and you can watch the service there. So put it on your calendar, the 26th. If you're an online person, you're all set. If you're an on-campus person, make a note of this. Some of you, are, I know some of you are going to show up. We're not going to be here. I'll say in advance, I told you. So there you go. That's the compassion of Pastor Kevin. Um, and la the last thing is our women's ministry has done something really neat, and it's a great way to shine the light of Jesus. They have put together these beautiful Christmas boxes. There's a coffee-themed box and a, and a tea-themed box, and they're something you can take as a gift to give to a friend of yours who's, who's not a believer. They're actually losing money on every box, so please don't do your Christmas shopping by buying their boxes. Uh, these are to give to somebody that you love and care about that needs to kind of have a fresh vision of Jesus. And in there is these gifts, but also a card that invites them to an on. They can click online, and they'll hear the gospel, the Christmas story, and the way that will connect for them. So if you have somebody like, man, there's somebody I'd like to, to, to bless this Christmas season who I'd like to have them know a little bit more about what Christmas is about, uh, you can go get one of the, you know, buy one of those boxes from them, and then you can take it and give it out. And I think they actually, when you buy one, they actually pray with you for whoever that person is, give it to you, and then you take it to that, that person. And so uh, we encourage you to do that after the service. We've got, we got some of those left in each of the coffee and the tea theme. If you're able to stand, if you're at home, online, on campus, stand with me if you can. And just take, open your heart to receive this word of blessing as we finish our time together. As you go out into the rest of this week and walk into the Christmas season, may you be amazed by the God who is holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. May you see the vision that Isaiah saw. And when he says, who may I send, would you raise your hand and say, send me? Would you understand that the one who is holy, 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 if you have come to the cross and received him, he has moved in. He's not leaving you. And he has made you holy. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. But he also calls you to grow in holiness. So walk in the power of the Spirit. Shine the light of Jesus. Be distinct and different. Love more than other people love. Forgive like our world doesn't forgive. Serve like nobody else serves. Be distinct and different. Be holy and show the light of Jesus. And if anybody asks you why, you tell them about Jesus who loves you and who loves them too. Amen? Have a great week. God bless you. We'll see you back here for our next sermon in the Arrival Series.